Uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this session, uh, which is a, a virtual overview of, of the master's degree in cognitive science. My name is Frank Keller. I'm a professor here in the School of Informatics. My area is computational cognitive science. In particular, I'm interested in uh, modeling uh, language processing and visual processing as well. Uh, today, I'll give you an overview of uh, the subject as we, as we see it here in Edinburgh. Uh, and then uh, a quick rundown of the degree that we're offering in cognitive science, um, explaining what kind of course choices you would have. Okay, so let's start with the question, what is cognitive science? And uh, you will have some idea, that's why you're here, I assume. Um, Often it's, it's a good way of approaching the question is to look at the disciplines that contribute uh, to the subject. And uh, canonically, people have included uh, psychology, philosophy, linguistics, anthropology, neuroscience, and artificial intelligence as the disciplines. Uh, every cognitive science program will have different uh, foci and emphasis on uh, aspects of these. Uh, in Edinburgh, because we're a school of informatics, um, the, the emphasis is more on the computational elements of the discipline. Uh, so, for example, the artificial intelligence component, uh, but also um, very strong in uh, linguistic and visual processing and, and in neuroscience. Uh, but as I said, this is a particular angle uh, that we're taking here in Edinburgh. I will um, now take you through a few examples to show you sort of the, the richness of, uh, of the discipline. And also these are mostly examples taken from my own teaching. So they, they, they actually represent uh, a slice of what you would be exposed to if you were on this degree. Okay, let's start with an example. So this is sort of a classical cognitive science example. Um, so let's assume your favorite pizzeria has a promotion on and for the price of one big pizza, 18 inch pizza, you can instead get two 12-inch pizzas. And now you're faced with a decision problem. Uh, what would you like, the, the two smaller pizzas or the one big pizza? And you might ask yourself, you know, what is, uh, which of these is better value? How would you even define better value? Is it, you know, the, the weight of pizza that you get or the surface area of pizza that you get? And cognitive scientists would wonder uh, first of all, experimentally or empirically, what kind of decision do people make in a situation like this? Uh, and then they would try to analyze these decisions mathematically, and then maybe also model them computationally and able to simulate the decision and also to predict decisions in other similar uh, circumstances. Well, in this case, uh, it's of course, uh, I don't want to say trick question, but a question with an unexpected answer because if you actually apply a bit of uh, simple maths, then you can work out that the area in the two small 12 inch pizzas is actually uh, less. It's um, 226 inch. Then in the one big 18 inch pizza, 254 inch uh, square inch. And um, if you ask participants to do this task. Most of them pick the two small pizzas, even though if you think in terms of area, that's actually the, the worst choice. Um, and now the question is, why is this? If we, if we dig into this particular problem a bit more, then we'll find that in general, uh, participants are bad at estimating areas. Uh, they're good at estimating distances and lengths. So one, in one dimension, but they're bad at estimating areas. Uh, also, for example, if you have a, a chart that represents a quantity as an area rather than as, as a length or as a height, uh, participants find this uh, much harder to understand. So it's, it's a general tendency. Um, and now, of course, cognitive scientists would also ask, how do we, do we explain this? Maybe people do not compute the area, maybe they use some sort of approximation and um, come up with a theory that explains this behavior, even though it's not in, in, in some sense a mathematically optimal behavior. And then also maybe try to build a computational model that can implement this behavior and maybe explain it in terms of, I don't know, memory limitations or something like that. So that's just uh, to give you an example for a prototypical cognitive science problem. And, and this is taken from um, 
paper by Andrea Martin is quite an influential uh, paper in the field. And now let's look at the individual disciplines. So here's back to our hexagon with the different contributing disciplines. Uh, let's maybe look at psychology first. And uh, as I said, this is uh, taken from one of my courses. So the, um, the question is, how do people acquire knowledge about numbers, about counting? So if you study uh, uh, children and their acquisition of numerosity, as it's called, then uh, children learn the number sequence very quickly. They'll tell you, I can count into 20 and so on. But then if you test them to actually figure out, do they know the numbers in the sense that they can match it against quantities, it's often not so clear. So for example, uh, if you ask them, can you give me three cookies? They might do this correctly. If you ask them, can you give me four cookies? Then suddenly it's just a bunch of cookies, right? So they, they actually don't know the meaning of four. They think it means something like many. And developmentally, we, we can see that uh, number knowledge develops uh, gradually over time. So children are able to number match first number one, then number two, then three cookies, four cookies. And at some point, they acquire what's called the cardinality principle, which means they can uh, match arbitrary numbers. Of course, as grown-ups, you know, you can ask me to, to, to give you 257 cookies and I can do this. I mean, it's very tedious, but there's no limit to the number of uh, cookies I can count. And this is called the cardinality principle. And there's an interesting linguistic aspect to this as well. So if you look at uh, various languages, so here on the, on the y-axis, we have various languages and, on, uh, and, and, and the colors here indicate at what age children um, know a given number concept. So one, uh, two, three, and then the cardinality principle, which means they're able to generalize. And this happens roughly at the same point in, in, in languages, even if they're quite different languages like um, Japanese and Czech or something like that. And uh, it even happens, and this is here in, in Simane, the last uh, set of bars here, and this is also where you know anthropology and other disciplines come in. Uh, so this is an indigenous culture uh, in Bolivia who don't count in the, con in, in the same way as, as Western cultures do. However, um, they can still number match and they still acquire the cardinality principle in the same as other cultures, but much delayed, as you can see here. So it takes up to 120 months um, to, to acquire the cardinality principle. And then again, we can ask, wh why is this? What is the relationship between counting and the cardinality principle? How would we mathematically model this and so on? Moving on um, to uh, philosophy and um, um, there's aspects of philosophy that uh, interact uh, closely with uh, cognitive science, philosophy of mind mostly, but also philosophy of language and philosophy of uh, computation that deals with questions with what functions are computable, uh, whether what functions can be uh, formalized and which logical uh, apparatus do you need. So for example, it turns out that first order logic cannot be uh, completely formalized, um, whereas propositional logic can be formalized and so on. So there's um, questions at the interface between uh, mathematics, uh, philosophy, or also uh, uh, theory of science. Um, linguistics is an important aspect and, and, and one that I'm very interested in. Linguists traditionally study the different levels of organization of language, spoken language in phonetics, phonology, or uh, word forms in morphology, syntactic structures like in this tree here. Uh, but also semantics and pragmatics, social linguistics, psycholinguistics, uh, language evolution, which, which happens to, to be a strength in Edinburgh, historical linguistics, which deals with language evolution in the short term, um, and also psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics. And I have a, a little example here of uh, a study that looks at reading. So here in the uh, in this little text, you can see superimposed eye movements. Eye movements um, 
are the way people read text. So as you read the text, your eye doesn't smoothly uh, go across the page, but it makes little jumps called saccades, and then it remains static in, in, um, in, in certain places for around uh, 200 milliseconds. These are called fixations. And then the question is, how do we model uh, this process? How do we model the fact that sometimes words are skipped, sometimes words are fixated more than once, sometimes we reread words, we go back, and so on. So it's actually quite a complicated process. So we can study it using a device like, like this, it's an eye tracker, and we can build models. So this is from my own work, uh, a model of, um, it, it's a simple recurrent network with an attention component and basically uh, trained using reinforcement learning that uh, acquires from a large amount of text behavior that looks quite similar to human eye movements here on the right. So that would be again an, an example for a cognitive scientist who want to study a behavior experimentally, uh, but then also model and predict it uh, using computational techniques. Okay, one quick thing. Uh, neuroscience is another strength in Edinburgh. Um, here what we see on the left are so-called cortical maps so these are, have been derived from brain imaging data fmri data and they plot how the vocabulary um, of of nouns and verbs in english is distributed over the cortex and we we can see that words that have similar meanings are also located um, in similar locations across the cortex. So this is sort of flattened out version of, of the cortex. And so you can get computational neuroscience studies like this that try to, uh, to analyze and visualize um, uh, neural uh, function, for example, to do with semantics or with uh, word meaning in this case. But uh, I also have colleagues who study um, computational psychiatry, which is basically trying to model um, uh, disease and, and conditions in, in the brain or colleagues who work really like down here on the neural level or on the level of neural assemblies where you study really in very fine detail what's going on in the brain. Okay, and then there's artificial intelligence and I sort of feel maybe I don't need to say much because it's all over the place. Um, AI is also interesting from a cognitive point of view. Um, most AI systems, while they do intelligent stuff, do so in a very different manner from what humans do. So they're not models of uh, human behavior. They're not cognitive models. However, um, they can often provide very useful tools. So some of the neural net models that uh, people have introduced uh, to build, I don't know, chatbots like ChatGPT they actually derive from um, from cognitive science and were invented by cognitive scientists in the 80s and then obviously um, developed quite more recently into into the huge models that you can get now and um, in in some cases there is evidence for example in terms of visual processing and this is an example here this is the uh, universal segmentation model um, that they behave in a similar way as uh, human segmentation in this case in the cortex. So in some cases there, there is a, a fairly loose relationship, but there is a relationship with what's going on uh, in the mind. And uh, in general, AI models are a, a good tool for understanding cognition um, when you're studying it. Okay, so uh, talking a little bit about the degree. So the degree, as I said, is uh, the aim is to uh, expose you to the wealth of, of research in cognitive science uh, with a focus on computational modeling, um, uh, with a focus on interdisciplinary working across different disciplines. As you saw, there's at least those six disciplines involved and um, most interesting problems straddle the boundaries between disciplines. Um, as I said, there's an emphasis on, on the one hand, uh, behavioral and experimental skills, but on the other hand, on, on computational research skills, communication um, to diverse audiences is also important. And uh, we also encourage students to specialize in, in at least one area. And the, 
the two main areas that we're offering are natural language and uh, computational neuroscience. Okay, let's uh, quickly talk about the course. Uh, so the course is a, a master's degree, uh, 180 credits. Um, in Edinburgh, all master's degrees are 180 credits. Uh, and is split into uh, a set of mandatory courses that all students need to take and optional courses um, in the cognitive science area. So the mandatory ones here are the, the yellow ones and then the optional ones uh, you can choose from a list of cognitive science courses here in green. And then there's electives. I'll talk about those more on the next slide. Okay, so to break down this 180 credits, the, the mandatory, mandatory courses include a seminar in cognitive modeling. This is a course that runs uh, across the two semesters and is meant to be the core of the cognitive science program and exposes students to, uh, to recent work and also initiates them into um, how to do research in, in the field. It has this double purpose. Then there's a mandatory course in computational cognitive science, which is basically a modeling course uh, that uh, teaches you how to build computational models uh, across a range of, um, of modeling techniques, probabilistic models, Bayesian models, neural models, but also across different areas, for example, uh, memory, vision, language. Um, then there's a research component, which consists of a project proposal, which happens in semester two. So together with a supervisor, uh, you're working to put together a, a research project um, in, in cognitive science. This happens in semester two of uh, your degree. And then there's an MSc project, a dissertation that you'll be working on over the summer. So uh, the, the, the course is split in three parts, two semesters of teaching, and then the summer is three months just devoted to the, um, to the summer project, to the research uh, dissertation, uh, supervised by the same supervisor that also supervised your project proposal. Um, then here is a list of courses that um, you can choose from. So they're, they're in the neuroscience area, for example, computational neuroscience or computational cognitive neuroscience. There's quite a lot of language and speech courses. Uh, There's a particular strength in Edinburgh. Uh, if you're interested in more applied cognitive science, there is courses on human computer interaction and human factors as well. Uh, down here, all of these can be chosen as part of the cognitive science um, uh, program. As part of the program, you can also select elective courses. These are much broader, basically, from everything else that informatics is offering. And it's it, we are a large school, so we have a, a lot of courses to choose from. And here are some examples. So electives in informatics would include neural computation, which is more neuroscience oriented, or bioinformatics. Uh, Algorithmic game theory, causal inference, reinforcement learning, various machine learning courses. There's at least five or six different ones. Uh, computer vision courses and graphics courses. Uh, a fairly large number of robotics courses. All these courses would also be open to you. And in addition to that, uh, from the School of Philosophy, Psychology and Language Sciences, there's also a, a fairly large set of electives. For example, in philosophy, there's a course on ethics of AI, uh, there's courses on brain imaging in, in cognitive neuroscience and psychology, and there's a fairly large set of uh, linguistics courses as well, which would look at, for example, language production, how to, to design online experiments, um, evolution of language, as I already mentioned, is a strength in Edinburgh. So that's also something you could um, specialize in if you want to. 